Coming up on Doctype, have you ever wanted to make some Web 2.0 reflections? Well now it's as easy as CSS3. Then, we delve into the world of YQL and learn how to consume web services with JavaScript. Nom nom nom. Nope, you're not dreaming, it really is time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Access Conference and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Oh my yes. So this week we have a lot of stuff to talk about, so we're just going to get right into it. I'm going to be talking about reflections and text strokes in CSS3. I'll be doing part one of a two-part series on YQL. Oh my. Let's check it out. When the Web 2.0 movement came along, most people in the design world went crazy using reflections. Now, reflections still have their place in the web design world, but now you can create them even more easily using CSS3. To create a reflection in the WebKit rendering engine, which is used by Chrome and Safari, you simply type WebKit box reflect and then punch in a few values. The first value is the direction. This is a constant and can be set to the strings above, below, left, or right. Usually, you'll want to set this to below so that your reflection will appear below the element. Next is the offset. This can be a pixel or percentage value, and it specifies the distance that the reflection should be from the edge of the original element. Usually, you'll want your reflection to be pretty close to the element, so this value will usually be set to something that's fairly small, and sometimes it might even be a negative value. Finally, there's the mask box image value. This is simply a mask box image that you can overlay over the reflection. If you leave it out, the reflection won't have a mask. The mask box image value is a great opportunity to use a linear gradient, because in most cases, you'll want your reflections to become less visible as they get further away from the element. In practical situations, reflections can be used to add depth to an image. They are capable of making objects feel like they're set further back in space. But just always remember that as fun as reflections may be, try not to overuse them. Have you ever wanted to add a stroke to some text like you can in Photoshop? Well then today is your lucky day. The text stroke property is new in CSS3, and using the WebKit vendor prefix, we can try it out in Chrome and Safari. After you type out WebKit text stroke, there's just two arguments to fill in. The first argument is the width. This will default to zero, but if you set it to a pixel value, you can specify just how much stroke you want to apply to your text. Next is the stroke color. This can be any CSS color, and it simply sets the color of the stroke. In addition to the text stroke property, there's also the text stroke fill property. This allows you to specify what color you want your text to be. If you don't use this property, the color of the text will default to the normal color property. So then, why are there two ways of doing this? The reason is, the text stroke fill property doesn't just allow you to set a color. It also allows you to make text transparent. In other words, if you had a text stroke and a text shadow on a block of text, you could set the text stroke fill to transparent and actually see the text shadow peeking through the hollow outline of the text. From a practical perspective, a text stroke can sometimes look pretty cheesy, but it's actually quite useful in combination with the first letter pseudo element. If you want to make the first letter of a block of text look extra fancy, now don't go away, because when we come back, Jim is going to show you the awesome that is YQL. It can be tough keeping up with all the latest in the development world when you're working like crazy. That's why you need to check out Axe as Conference 2010, a conference in Orlando, Florida, dedicated to helping you learn new stuff and improve your craft. From October 28th through 30th, you'll learn the latest techniques and tips for being an agile Ruby on Rails developer with hands-on workshops, sessions, open spaces, lightning talks, and more. For the past two years, this conference has sold out, so go to accessconference.com today, enter the code DOCTYPE, and get 15% off. We hope to see you there. Yahoo's YQL service allows us to consume web services directly from the browser. 
Today we're going to get up and running with YQL in JavaScript. Web services are becoming more and more important in web development. The problem is there's no standardization in calling web services or the information that's returned. YQL, or the Yahoo Query Language, is a service from Yahoo that offers a standardized way to access hundreds of web services. YQL uses a SQL-like query language and a standardized JSON or XML response format. Different service calls are represented as tables. For instance, the flickr.photos.search table will allow you to search for photos on Flickr. Or the table twitter.user.status will allow you to see the status for a specific Twitter user. The queries also take predicates, like what term you would like to search for on Flickr, or what user you would like to see on Twitter. Constructing queries and inspecting the responses might be a tedious task if it weren't for the YQL console. The console at developer.yahoo.com slash yql slash console allows you to test your queries and inspect the results. You can see your results either as the raw XML or JSON, or as a formatted tree view. To test a command, just type it into the box at the top and click test. If there are any errors, they will be displayed to you in a box below that input. The console offers a large list of available tables from a lot of popular APIs. Clicking one of them in the bottom right corner of the screen will bring up a sample query that you can use to explore the table. One of the best parts of YQL is that all of the tables are available over JSONP. For more about JSONP, see episode 17 of Doctype. Because JSONP is available, we can make YQL calls directly from the browser using JavaScript without worrying about cross-domain requests. When using the console, you can select JSON, give it a callback function name, and then you can copy the URL out of the REST query box and place it in a script tag on your page. When you load up your page, the web service will be called and your callback function will be executed with the results as an argument. In the next episode, we'll show you how to retrieve almost any piece of information on the web using YQL. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So, we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype